start by asking you in the audience, uh, how many of you know anyone personally that has committed suicide? I'm trying to see. Raise your hand. It's quite a few of you. Quite a few of you. So suicide is a really a healthcare, healthcare epidemic that's not really classified the same for some reason as heart disease and cancer. In the United States, last year, 45,000 people committed suicide in the United States. In the ages 14 through 24, it's the leading cause of death. It leads to all other causes in, in that age group. And in every demographic, almost every demographic, is increased dramatically in the last 10 years. And it's the 10th leading cause of death overall in the United States. So you say, okay, well, why are you talking about this? Well, let me tell you a little story. Many, many years ago when I was in high school, I ran for senior class president of my high school class. I don't know if any of you are juniors in high school, but don't do it. What happens is you get voted in your senior class president, you're in charge of your class reunions forever. <laughs> so for the last literally 40 years, I have been in very close contact with my high school classmates, and that's not a bad thing, I, I enjoy that but it just kind of prompted me to keep in touch with everybody a lot closer than, say, uh, usual. What's happened in the last two or three reunions that we've had, we have one every five years, is more and more of my classmates from high school have committed suicide. And about a year and a half ago, actually, one of my best friends in high school, who I uh, was a great athlete, he was one of the star football players, very good-looking guy, popular smart, everything going for him in high school. After high school, things didn't really go as well as we had hoped. So he happened to be living here in Oxford, Mississippi. And one day, about, like I said, a year and a half ago, he walked out behind his house, put a gun to his head, and shot himself in the head. So I've been hit on a personal, in a personal way by this, this health care problem. On a professional front, I'm an anesthesiologist, and I oversee a very busy operating room at Forest General Hospital. We're a level two trauma center. We deal with a lot of, lot of things, anything you can imagine just about. But one thing we do deal with, and I deal with all too frequently, is called an organ harvest. An organ harvest is when we do, we harvest, literally harvest the organs, the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, of people who are brain dead. And frequently these people are brain dead because they've committed suicide. Their bodies are alive, but their brains are dead. So we, we do that more often than I'd like to, like to think. So we do that. And also, on an even more frequent basis, we repair folks that have tried to commit suicide, anywhere from slitting their wrist, we've had people stab themselves in the chest, to shoot themselves in the head and, and survive that somehow or another. So we do operations on those folks almost weekly. So I have this professional and personal connection with, with suicide, the suicide problem. So I thought my role as a physician with this was as an anesthesiologist, what I, what I do. I do what I do. Until one day I was reading, and you think, well, he's reading the Journal of American Medical Association or the... American Society of Anesthesia Journal, whatever. But no, I was reading a business journal in Bloomberg, which I love business. I love to read about business. And I came across this article in Bloomberg about these guys, these anesthesiologists actually in Vegas that were doing a ketamine clinic for depression. I was going, are you kidding me? First off, you know, you're thinking, what, what's the deal? Ketamine, special K, this is the date rape drug. Yes, it is. But it's an anesthesia drug that I've administered in my practice for 30 years. So let me tell you a little bit about ketamine and its origins. It was first synthesized in 1970 and first used clinically in Vietnam in 1974. It was a, it was, and it's still being used by the Army and, and, and the Marines on, uh, to be given to soldiers who are badly hurt on the front line. They can actually, the, the, the medicine is so good at killing pain and not uh, suppressing uh, respiration, that it's very safe 
relatively speaking, to get to these soldiers that have their limbs blown off uh, out on the front line and give them enough pain medication to get them back uh, to the front forward hospitals. So it, it was a great drug for that because it, it, it kills pain without depressing respiration. So in my uh, training, I was trained at University of Texas, and we did a, a burn center there, the Shriners Burn Center at, at Galveston, and we did frequent operations on kids that had been burned almost over 80, 90 percent of their body, and we had to do daily operations on these kids. And now my first experience with ketamine was doing anesthetics on these kids that had to have these daily operations. And over the years, we've used ketamine for different things, uh, mainly for pain control of patients who narcotics don't work very well. When I said we gave these to these soldiers, the reason we didn't give them morphine, if we gave them enough morphine to kill their pain, they would quit breathing. But give them ketamine, it doesn't kill the breathing. So uh, I've used morphine, administered it in my practice on the patients that are, say, uh, are narcotic abusers or somehow they're resistant to routine pain medications, or we give it as a supplement pain uh, control type drug. But I, I you know, that's the only way we've ever used it. We, uh, I've never heard of it being used for depression and, and, and much less suicidal thoughts, which I hadn't really, didn't really occur to me when I first read that article. So it kind of got me interested. So I started, I started digging around into anesthesia literature to see if there was anything I could find that connected ketamine with depression. And sure enough, there was nothing in my literature, in, ke in, uh, in anesthesia literature. But as I looked at the psychiatric literature, yes, there were a number of small studies over the last decade, decade and a half, that showed a sub-anesthetic intravenous dose of ketamine given through a vein. Uh, when I say sub-anesthetic dose, not enough to induce anesthesia, but enough to uh, cause some uh, really weird effects. I'll tell you about that in a second. That it did decrease depression, and even more importantly, uh, it did away with suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideations, what we call it. So I got to thinking, so how, did, how did anybody figure that out? I've been, using that, this, I've been using this in my practice for many, many years, and I just never, never really, that would have never really occurred to me. So I got curious about it, and I looked further back, and, and relatively recent, as, as, as medical discoveries go, it was relatively recent, in the year 2000, there were some researchers at Yale that were, trying to replicate schizophrenia with low-dose ketamine. And what low-dose ketamine does, it causes you to have these uh, hallucinogenic effects, your mind out of body experiences, things like that. And that's why you know, it is somewhat popular on the street. Uh, called, and that's why it's called Special K, gives these trips. But nevertheless, they were trying to replicate uh, schizophrenia and, uh, on these volunteers. But the, and when the volunteers came back after the study, some of them happened to be depressed for whatever reason. I'm not sure if they, they, were, they didn't have enough money, so they volunteered to get the cash to do the study or something. But they uh, reported that they weren't nearly as depressed as they were as than before they got the ketamine. So it got the guys scratching their heads and said, okay, let's put together a study of patients who have failed other treatments like uh, cognitive therapy, oral antidepressants that you hear about, even maybe electroshock therapy, and see if ketamine has any effect on these people. So sure enough, they did a small study with the same dose that they had of IV ketamine, and these people did report improved uh, depression scores. But more importantly, if any of them happened to have had suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts, those com were completely obliterated at least for a short time. And so over the ensuing 15 years, there have been a number of studies around the world that have confirmed that yes, ketamine does have a positive effect on, effect on depressed patients. And, and uh, there's still no consensus of, of how you do these infusions. Uh, for the, the best guess right now is we, we would do the infu they would do the infusions two or three a week for a couple weeks and then start trying to space them out more and more until you could uh, space them out to as needed basis. As far as how the ketamine works, nobody really knows. I could stand up here for two hours and tell you all the uh, theoretical reasons I think it works, but there's always a hole in those theories. So right now, it's not even worth talking about. That hasn't 
uh, kept the drug from being looked at by the large drug companies. The reason, I, th- I was thinking to myself, why haven't I heard about this? Because, you know, I'm, a, I'm one of the, you know, as a licensed board-certified anesthesiologist, I should have heard about this. But the reason I haven't, I think, is because the drug companies have really no interest in generic ketamine. And the reason for that is they can't make any money with it. I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. This is they just can't. So they, they do know about ketamine, though. So what, in fact, two of the drug companies right now, two of the big drug companies, which I won't name, the FDA has given them fast-track approval to develop a analog of the molecule ketamine that they can uh, make, maybe make it e- easier to administer or maybe minimize the side effects, the, the psychiatric side effects, so they can patent this drug and then start licensing it out, make, make billions of dollars, because this is a huge need for this, if this drug can work, and work it so quickly, which is unlike some of the other drugs that, that may take months or may not ever work, this is a huge market. Okay, so the drug companies are interested in ketamine in a kind of a sideways point of view. The FDA, like I said, gave approval for these developments to occur, but we're still, they're still years off from these being released to the public. But as I sat there and thought about it, I said, you know, here I am, I have 30 years experience administering this drug. It's a very simple formula, it's a simple recipe. It requires very simple monitoring. Maybe right now I could help somebody that's suicidal, that has no other hope, that maybe I could do something to help someone. And, and with partnership with uh, one of the, my psychiatry partners there in Hattiesburg. So I approached uh, the local psychiatric hospital, actually set up a meeting to talk to the psychiatric staff there. And, um, and I, I brought up this, this idea that I had that, that you have any failed patients for, that are, are suicidal that maybe I could be a last resort resource for you. And they were very receptive and nice to me, but I, you know, I didn't really... Re- nothing really happened. And and as I thought about it, well, there's, you know, I can kind of understand that. This is not a mainstay or a normal treatment for depression and suicidal thoughts. Uh, Even though it can be very effective, it's still an experimental stage. So this is an off-label use of ketamine. This is not a, and I can legally do it, but it's off-label. And what that means is, I'm not going to get paid by an insurance company for this. I'm not going to get paid, or, or the psychiatrist isn't going to get paid by Medicare or Medicaid or anything else. So they weren't really interested in doing something for free. So, you know, I almost gave up. And there was one last psychiatrist that I had not talked to. I went to talk to her, Dr. Beverly Bryant, who happens to have just recently taken a, uh, a faculty job at the University of Mississippi in the Department of Psychiatry there. But she was a local psychiatrist. And she did express an interest and did have a very small pool of patients that she thought might uh, get improvement with this, with this treatment. And uh, when she mentioned it to one particular patient, he was so interested and so... Th- this patient had, had these deep, deep suicidal thoughts that really weren't complicated by any other issues. He didn't have any schizophrenic issues. He didn't have any substance abuse issues or anything. He just had these deep-seated urges to kill himself. Uh, He had a uh, contracting business, a very normal guy. You met him on the street. You you would not know anything was wrong. But uh, he was so desperate for help that when we even mentioned it to him, uh, when, when Dr. Bryant mentioned it to him, he actually showed up in my uh, emergency room one Saturday when I was on call and begged me to do an infusion on him because he thought he was going to kill himself that weekend. And so we did. We did a, a low-dose infusion on him in the emergency room that day. And then in, in the ensuing, he did, he did a lot better, by the way. And over the ensuing months, we have done uh, multiple series of infusions on him. We would stack them, like I said before, a couple a week, and then we'd spread them out further and further. And we actually, over the last few months, we actually changed him to a compounded nasal spray form that we had a local compounder make for us. And he is, to this day, doing very well, and he's not suicidal. And he credits Dr. Bryant and I for keeping him alive. So if nothing else, 
that one Bloomberg article did save, I think, at least one life. We have a, I have a very small pool of patients. This isn't a big thing that I'm doing, but I did have a couple more patients that I've, uh, I think we've, been, we've helped somewhat, but they have other issues. There, there are other things going on in their lives. One is a, uh, has a substance abuse history, and one has uh, uh, some psychological issues, which the ketamine is not going to fix. But as far as the, the suicidal thoughts, I think we did improve those at least for a short time. But the takeaway point from this is suicide is, is a really huge problem, especially in a younger population. And I think we're on the very cups of a new manner of treating suicidal ideation and, and, and deep depression, which I think is going to be, in the next 20 to 50 years, going to be a, a whole new avenue of uh, treatment. Thank you. Thank you.